I feel like now that I'm in a space where I can advocate, I can say, I blast it to the rooftops for all of the teachers who can't, for all mm-hmm. teachers who mm-hmm. get pulled into the office or who get their hands slapped or go to HR or have to go to the board office. I feel like my platform is just, our platform is just that important for us to speak out, to be able to advocate and, and fight and do the things you need to do for humanity. Yeah. Welcome to the Kindness Is podcast, where we take a deep dive into the true meaning of kindness. I'm your host, Caitlin Johnstone, the co-founder of Kind Cotton. Let's dive in. Wake up. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Kindness Is pod. Today I am so grateful because my two guests are people who I have had the pleasure of meeting in person, and I don't get to say that that often. So today I have Michael and Nita Creekmore. They are a married couple, both with more than 35 years combined experience in the field of education. Together they have Creekmore conversations in which they facilitate learning experiences around the importance of building, maintaining, and restoring relationships in education. And recently, they wrote Every Connection Matters, Building, Maintaining, and Restoring Relationships Inside the School and Out. I'm so happy you guys are here. We're so yes, excited to be here. We are as well. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for having us, Caitlin. Absolutely. And I was like, you know, we started chatting a little bit before I pressed record because speaking of building relationships, right? I feel like social media is the space in which we're fortunate to have been able to build relationships with so many people throughout the years that we've been connected there. And I really value that space and value connections such as the ones that we've built throughout the years. So it's pretty cool to have you on the podcast. Yeah, we feel the same way. I feel like it's been amazing, amazing connection. And then like, we also, we saw you in person. Like, yes. That's just so <laughs> awesome. That's I know. That's the cool part. That's the super cool part. <laughs> yeah. That is the super cool part, especially because I feel like you all do so many things um, when it comes to presenting and really being in that teacher world. And that was the one conference we, we met at a conference. What? It must have been like two years ago now, because we were like really still... I'm surprised I went, to be honest with you, because we were still really in the height of the pandemic. And I remember feeling like this extra sense of community around the two of you because we were like the only ones masking, I remember (laughs) at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, (laughs) So, yeah, it's pretty cool. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. Um, I just want to know, first of all, because I get asked this a lot, what Mm -hmm. is it like? having a partner in life and a partner in business. Oh, you're, you're getting spicy. So, okay. Yes. So it's such a blessing <laughs> to be able to like someone to understand what you are going through, right? Like initially, like Mike has always been around the education field of a therapist, like going into schools. So when he was doing that, I was teaching in schools. Um, and then when he started being a school counselor along with a therapist, um, I think he got to see like more of like the day to day in and out type of thing. So I think he understood like my day to day a little bit better. Yeah. Um, just about yeah. just being in the classroom and how much sometimes how much pressure that can be and how stressful that could be. Um, how tiring it could be. Tiring me. Like mm-hmm. I, mean, I still go to bed super early, but like, yeah, like I'm, I was knocked out. I do all like the family stuff together and then I would be like in the bed. And so mm-hmm. um, it so that part of it, like now is such a blessing of like the fact that like we can we do understand it we do have like empathy for each other and things like that um and then we started writing the book like even though we are a collective unit and we're clearly like married and together there are some things that we did we agreed on there's some things that we were like ooh, yeah. like you know what i mean like we didn't really like agree on and um and we and we talk about that in the book yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i want to hear more mike what do you think it it is definitely, I always say, whenever asked, what is it like being married to a, a, an educator? I say, you know, the good part is you get it. And mm-hmm. the bad part is you get it. Yeah. <laughs> so especially now, um, because even though Nita is, she's still very close to education. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the topics, um, she's a little bit more, and I, I can say this, Yeah. she's a little bit more freer to speak on. Yeah. Because prior to that, she was in the county. Um, 
that it was not like the I the thing to do. Hand. Yeah, I it wasn't the thing to do hand. to yeah. talk about controversial um topics. Yeah, so, you know, I would you, I'll get called into the principal's office. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. like, like literally <laughs> called to the principal's office. <laughs> yeah. Like, hey, uh, I saw this post that you had. Yeah. Um, I just got a call from our superintendent. They they say you might want to take that down. Like yeah. those types of things. Yeah. So since those things don't happen anymore, it's a little bit more free flowing. So yeah, I do have a little more freedom. Yeah, a lot more. Well, no, no, but, yeah, I can imagine. Tell yeah. me more about that, Nita. I because I feel okay. So here's my thing. Okay. Similarly to you, I'm not in the classroom anymore. I haven't been now for like three and a half years, which I still can't even believe. But at the time, I think we were in a different world. Mm -hmm. So my post would always be quote unquote controversial, right? Like if anyone ever followed Kind Cotton. There are people who would say that my posts are controversial. Right. I would always look at it as we're just trying to be on the side of humanity, right? Right. 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 So what I would say now, especially because I was teaching in the state of Florida, like I can't even fathom what would like oh. what it would look like if I was called into the principal's office. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you can share with us a little bit about navigating being an educator in a political world, right? Mm -hmm. Because education is political. Things yes. come up, unfortunately. I don't think it should be. Mm -hmm. um, and then I do think it should be for certain ways, in certain ways. But tell me what that was like. Um, it was hard. I, I do remember being in tears, crying, and like feeling like I was being muzzled. Um, and then I still continue to share, like it's 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 such a hard space because I continue mm -hmm. I, I still continue to share the things that I was sharing, but I had to wordsmith it a little bit better. Um and as you can see, eventually I just wasn't there anymore. Mm -hmm. Um and I know that it sounds harsh, but my self-care and what I believe in and what I value trumped. <laughs> <laughs> like that was like everything, right? And I had gotten to a place where I was just like, I just, I just, I can't, I can't do this anymore here. And I just feel mm -hmm. like the hard part with that is the heartbreaking part of that is that you, the thing that you love, and a lot of times it's like the kids and, mm -hmm. and some of the teachers, you know what I mean? Like you just love them, you also leave them. Um, and so there's like this guilt there um, of like taking care of self and then also um having to to leave a space that's just toxic and unhealthy for myself and my family um and then like i feel like now that i'm in a space where i can advocate i can say i blast it to the rooftops for all of the teachers who can't for all mm -hmm. teachers who mm -hmm. get pulled into the office or who get their hands slapped or go to hr or have to go to the board office i feel like my platform is just our platform it's just that important for us to speak out and speak up um, where we can't. And although like some people may think, oh, social media is just social media. It is such a strong platform oh, yeah. um, to be able to advocate and, and fight and do the things you need to do for humanity. Yeah, It truly is. I mean, if none of us ever said anything about anything that's going on in the world, then nothing will get done. And I know sometimes, you could probably relate to this. We feel as though we're kind of like screaming into the void, right? Like I've been having a lot of conversations about this lately with friends and and followers even about, well, I'm doing the things that are quote unquote supposed to create change, right? Like I am I am using social media. I'm calling my reps. I'm attending protests. I'm, I'm boycotting. I'm like doing all of these things and then I'm not seeing that change. And I guess my question to you is, what would you say to someone like that when someone is feeling defeated? So I think the best thing to do initially is to try to make the changes in spaces where you have that control. Um, a lot of times in your, your four walls, that's your domain. Although your admin, whether it be your principal, your AP, whomever, your instructional coach, whoever is the person that's your immediate supervisor, regardless of what it is that they're saying, when they walk out of that door, it's your four walls, it's your domain. So yes, okay, yeah, I know you want me to do it this way. Okay, yep, 
Okay, I got it. Check. Got it. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got you. Once they leave that, that classroom, once they leave your classroom, mm -hmm. you've built that within, you've built that community within your students, and then you can go about it the best way that you see fit. And you still have to do what you know is the best thing to do and the right thing to do, even if you are feel, uh, fearful, you're like scared, do it afraid, still do it because mm -hmm. it's the right thing to do. It is. Um, so that's the first thing that I would say is trying to make those small changes mm -hmm. in your own personal spaces where you do have more control over that. Mm -hmm. And I also like feel like when you do that, that makes you feel more empowered and like you have more agency, mm -hmm. easier to see even if it seems small, like, you know what I mean? Like, even if it's, if it's okay, I want to have more inclusive books on my bookshelves and I'm like yeah. fighting for that in the, our libraries and for, you know, for our kids, that is such a big change. Like you feel like, okay, this is just our small community, mm -hmm. but the more you do things like that, the more change happens, right? The more you speak up about problematic things that are said about students in schools, you know, it, it seems minute, but it's so huge. And not enough folks are are taking that step when they when they feel afraid and i think i mean that's that's the way society works i mean this is yeah. this is how it's played you know like we invoke fear so that nobody does anything and we stay um complacent with how things are i'm so happy that you both brought that back to education because that is my problem like i'm always and i kept thinking in my own mind this even relates to my four walls of my home, right? Like I'm not in the classroom anymore, but I have this daughter who I am responsible for putting out into the world, you know? And what are the things that she is learning? What are the conversations that we are having? What are the books that she is reading? Yeah. What is it that she sees her mom and dad standing up for, right? Mm -hmm. Those things are going to be impactful. And, and I'm happy that, you reminded me that even doing those things when you don't feel as though you are reaching that grand, you know, medal, <laughs> like it's not like you're getting that huge reward mm -hmm. are still just important. And I think a lot of people need to hear that. Mm -hmm. So we touched upon this a little bit, but I know something that both of you are super passionate about, something that is in your book, something that you've spoken about on your platforms is really being that person for your students, right? Like creating those relationships, being culturally responsive in your teaching practices. Mm -hmm. All of these things that we bring as an educator to the classroom are so, so, so important. And in certain areas are somewhat under attack right now. So I want to know two things. One, why do you think it is so important? And two, what do you think about all of like the awful legislation? You know, when I think of myself as an educator, kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back as to me leaving the classroom was when our session on cultural responsive teaching was removed from my district because people were, you know, mm -hmm. complaining about it. A few loud voices. Um, right. So, yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. So we started with the book, just having conversation. And it was even before it was a book. Me and Mike were just coming home. <laughs> so having the educators are married to educators. Yeah, yeah. Like coming home, talking a, about. It was an event session. I it was probably events. Yeah. It was probably. And then like, we would like be intentional about like today, we're going to look for like really good ones. Like, like, mm -hmm. let's come home and like, you know, share some great things. Like, you know, that we see teacher to teacher, teacher to student. I mean, that's really what we have on our book, mm -hmm. teacher to teacher, teacher to student, leader to teacher, like, you know, all of the relationships that that truly matter in a school. Um, and not saying that teacher to student relationships aren't important, like that is the core. And in order for a teacher to really thrive, it all matters. And so in answering your question, like that's how the book was birthed through like conversation, conversation between us and mm -hmm. our four kids. And um, and I feel like for, for me, and then I'll let you talk, okay. but like for me, I think when you have a strong community and it's like a collective and you have values that are aligned as a community, that's why like even creating like core values as a, as a school is important. Mm -hmm. Like when you can align on that, 
that you're like a united front. Like these are the things that we're aligning on. And I think what happens, this is my own personal opinion, what happens is like you were saying, like those two strong voices end up like impacting the whole community and everyone is afraid. Like it, it's birthed in fear. Even though people are like, most most people are probably like, this is what needs to happen right. for us, for our students, for like a better world. And yet they're still afraid. And so I feel like when you when you build that strong foundation of like relationships and, and having a thriving community and can actually have conversations, hard conversations and conversations that move the needle, that's when I feel like that can be dismantled. I, I feel like at its core, a lot of people don't want to do the work. Um, mm. There's work to be done when there's when you're mm. talking about building relationships. Because as we talk about build, maintain, and restore. Well, you can't really restore something that was never built, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're walking into the classroom and you feel like that's not my job to, you know, do this, to do that, it's not my job to like be these kids, it's not my job to like my coworkers. My job is to teach them this information. Well, they're really not going to learn it. Like they're not going to reach their potential unless you're pouring into them. You pour into them by building that relationship, mm -hmm. allowing them to know you. And allowing, you know, allowing yourself to be vulnerable enough for them to know you, but then also taking the time and allowing them to share their story with you. So learning them, too. But I think a lot of times um, people don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. And then especially when it comes to marginalized communities, they don't want to hear the stories. They don't want to deal with the things that make them feel uncomfortable because it's that icky feeling. It's the well, I didn't grow up that way. Like, oh, oh, like, what should I do with that? It makes me feel or uncomfortable. Guilt. Yeah. Yeah. Or, <laughs> or because they're saying that, and I know that I might be tied to a, a similar situation, and I profited or benefit from being related or in the bloodline of whomever. Um, it may be guilt. It may be feelings of discomfort. But all of it boils down to not wanting to do the work. It, I I agree with you on that. But I also think that I also think it's like. People think it's going to take too much time. I think mm -hmm. that I think another that, thing. I think it's another time, and I also think that too. Like you can't have culturally responsible pedagogy without relationships. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, you can't. Mm -mm. You know what I mean? So like it's one of those things that's like, and then you can't. Your kids can't fully thrive without relationships. It's all intertwined, and so it's one of those things that's like, you take the time to get to know your students. I mean, like really get to know your students, not like. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite color? I mean, that's yeah. that's great and all, and I do want to know that. But like, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> yeah. not, isn't it? like, do you have any siblings? Like, what what was it like? And I'm and I could say, like, for me, sometimes I have to backtrack because, again, being in the school counselor mode, there are a lot of things that I'm going to know more of mm -hmm. because right. of that my my role in school. But some stuff, you know, if it took me all of five seconds to sit down and talk to this student and find out that this was what was going on. I think there are some there are some instances where a teacher can do that too. Yeah, I mean, now, I understand a, there are many more students in the class, but there mm -hmm. are some instances, not all, but there are some where they it's just a conversation to be had. And it's so funny <laughs> you can do that. You can have a prompt at a morning meeting that you learn mm -hmm. so much yes. about your students. You can have a prompt yep. at a staff meeting and learn so much about your staff. Mm -hmm. That's you know what I mean. You can do it. It's like all of these things you can do to learn about just people. Yeah, just learn about their story, and so. There's been so many times like where a prompt has been said, like I've done that um, when I was in schools being instructional coach. I say a prompt and like, oh my goodness, you we're having so this conversation yep. about how we grew up. And it would never happen. And it would have way. never happened yep. like any other way. Like, cause it, I can be honest, like there was a person that I wasn't like the best with getting <laughs> along with. And like, we just start, like we're scooping ice cream and we start having a conversation about how we grew up. And, we're laughing and talking. I'm like, how do we have this connection? Like, it's because it, I would have never, I'm just being honest, like in my, in my, the story I was telling myself about that person was like, they're closed minded. They treat kids bad. These are all the stu the stories I was telling myself. Now, some of them, I mean, just didn't serve me well, but some stories were probably not true that I was, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? About this person. And so it's just about having conversation, connecting with each other, being, having an open heart and open mind mm -hmm. and being able to shift when it's time to shift when I mean, you need to shift and it, yep doing and doing and again that prompt was the work yep. the work yep. doesn't have to be hard like mm -hmm. i guess that's the main thing i want to drive we want to drive home is the work doesn't have to be hard like it can be a conversation it doesn't have to be like 
some five page essay about yeah how you're gonna do this in your classroom and I need a lesson plan. Like it doesn't always have to be that. Mm -hmm. So, but it, it's so much stuff that so many people have in common that they never find out because they don't take the time to have the conversation. Yeah. It's funny because once you have the conversation and you feel connected to the person, you're compelled to change. But people don't want to do that. I'm thinking two things as you were both talking. One, I think a lot of educators, it goes back to the time thing that you were saying, Nita. And it's just like, oh, I have all of this on my plate. And that's like a, a, a true systemic problem, right? Mm -hmm. Because educators do have too much on their plates. Like there is, there is a lot of truth behind that. But then there's also that piece to it that you may have a little bit more time within the constraints mm -hmm. that are put upon you if you take yes. that little bit of extra yes. time yes. to get to know one another, right? To yes. get to know your students, to get to know each other. But I'm curious to hear from both of you, what would you say is the most important thing to get everyone on board? Like, how can you shift a school culture so that it is centered around relationships? How can you get, you know, the women in the lunchroom down to the students, to the bus drivers, to everyone kind of like feeling like you're in this special place where relationships do matter? You can read our book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we are book. We yes. Have, yeah. No. Um. Seriously, yeah. we have a lot of we do have a lot of strategies. Um, yeah. Yeah. For sure. In our book. Um. Because one thing we say in our book is that the people are different. Like people mm -hmm. are different, and so like in a school culture, it is important as the leader of the school because I really think that the leader starts moves, at the top, moves the needle yep. there. Absolutely. Um. To know that like my staff is different like mm. i have to know that like nita is a little bit introverted so like i might need to put nita in a small group versus like expect yep. nita to like talk in like whole group space mm -hmm. right um it's no different than you have a classroom and you're like differentiating for your students it's the same thing but i think like in education for me and i'll let you talk mike but we have to slow down we are moving too Way fast too. Mm -hmm. it is like we're 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 getting to like the standards, but we're not getting underneath the iceberg. And so underneath the iceberg is like getting to know the, the staff, building our building our school culture, making sure it's a it's a great place to work. Because guess what? If everyone's happy to work, then they'll be happy with the students, right? Mm -hmm. They're happy with the students. I'm not saying like hundred percent I'm taking this happy pill, but what I'm saying is is like the places where I have thrived, I did not want to leave. I tell this I tell the story all the time and I'm excited of hearing it. I was at Dumfries Elementary. We had what year was it? What year was it? 2008, <laughs> 2008 to 2013, and we had we had a wonderful school culture. Were there folks that didn't get along? Absolutely, we had conflict, right? But like the the core of the school and the culture of the school was strong to the point, like you know, me and Mike got engaged and I got married. I had to leave. I like I cried. Folks cried. Like we were just like it was heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. I got messages from staff members saying, like, I can't believe you've taken our girl. <laughs> yeah. so, like, See, I mean, it exists. It, yeah. it, it exists. Yeah. And I and and I and I think I said this before or someplace else, but like, yes, teachers need to be paid more, right? Because that we need to be paid more. Absolutely, I'm gonna stamp that and tattoo it on my arm somewhere. But like <laughs> I feel like even in that moment that we were all freaking broke. <laughs> We were happy and broke and teaching mm -hmm. kids and the kids were thriving and, and people were coming to, to the school who wasn't supposed to like thrive and be like, what the heck are y'all doing here? Because y'all are thriving. Yeah. And so I feel like that it that can happen. I have hope that that can happen. Um, and I think it starts with the, I think it's, we think it starts with the leaders. We think it starts with everybody just really having the will to like wanting, want this culture. Um, and wanting to do the work. And the thing is, they're not going to do, unless, you know, you are exemplary, you're not going to do well on the standardized test if you don't have the relationships because kids aren't going to want to learn. Kids aren't going to be engaged. Like, I'm so, one of my biggest things now that I get so tired of hearing 
now there's all of this talk about like social emotional learning being so bad too. Yep. And kids don't need to be talking about like their feelings and how to be a decent human being. And I'm like, listen, <laughs> in yeah. my eight years of teaching, yeah. I like not to like toot my own horn or whatever, but I consistently got the highest scores. And that was not because I sat there and drilled my kids about reading, writing, and arithmetic. It was because I was invested in them yeah. and I cared about their mental well being. I cared mm -hmm. about how they were handling emotions. I cared yeah. about, you know, knowing that so and so needed a fist bump every single morning and then little Johnny might need a hug. It's like they're not going to learn the way you need them to learn for those benchmarks if yeah. they're not feeling seen if they're not reading books in which they feel seen right right, right. Like, it's all connected it's all connected and i will add on to what you said in the sense of like the same thing goes for t teachers on the team like and so like when you're thinking about students excuse me i can think of times where i showed up to work and i just was not in a space like i just where my where my teacher cohort was like yo Go take about a 15 minute break. I can tell, mm -hmm. send your students yeah. over here. I can tell you're having a hard morning, right? That matters. That matters. Like it just does. And 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 those are the type of relationships we're like we're talking about. Like for me to know that not only are we all there for the students and uplifting the students and making sure they thrive, but making sure that each other are uplifted yeah. and we're thriving and we're asking each other really how are you doing right mm -hmm. you know what i mean not like just surface level and not right? the, and it's not the hunger games right like i wait for you to mess up so i can go tell the leader right, but so like, i go tell an admin no, that you did yeah. it <laughs> and but, they can put me over that committee next because i've been waiting for it with all that being said where <laughs> can people get your fabulous book how can they support you all how can they oh. learn more about how to do this and the strategies behind it specifically tell us how they can support you they can they can go to ascd yeah. is where like we would say first to get it from ascd yeah uh, and then um they can also go to amazon and get it from amazon and barnes and noble and barnes and noble it was yeah. sold out of barnes and noble i don't know if it's still sold out but um yeah yeah that's, that's right. exciting yeah that is yeah. exciting we put our heart <laughs> yes. and soul and yeah everything into it and it was and we were very vulnerable in the book as well because yeah. we're honest about the fact that we didn't always get it right yeah mm, i love that can you talk about that for a little bit like yeah. the repair portion of things like once you have those relationships yeah. built yeah. and again i of course think back to my daughter right which is something that i feel like our generation like in our parents generation it was like well you like kind of do as I say. And if yeah. I mess up, like I'm not apologizing to a kid, yeah. but like today, even like I felt like I was a little short with my daughter. And although the intent behind it was, well, we need to get in the car right now and get home. My mm -hmm. delivery was not the best. So I was like, you yeah. know what, Ken's mama's just having a hard time right now. I need to take a deep breath. And I'm sorry that I said that to you the way that I do, but it's time to buckle our seatbelt, you know? Yeah. And she was like, it's okay, mama. And like, yes. she buckled her little seatbelt. And yeah. I think that's so important. Yes. So I want to hear yeah. in, you know, an educational aspect. Yeah. Tell us a story. It's extremely important. Yeah. Um, this is when I was working at a um, psychiatric hospital. And it was a student who was in class. I had a pretty solid relationship with this student, um, with that student that was in class. And he started having, started disrupting the classroom. Started flipping over desks and it was, it was a full on disruption. And usually at a psychiatric hospital, oftentimes they'll call a nurse to come in and give a PRN. And that's like a shot okay. and that's a, um, but usually it's an involuntary shot that goes usually in the in the behind in the backside, and usually it's um, a sedative type of uh, psychotropic drug, so like Thorazine, Haldol, something to that effect. And usually after that happens, a student is down for a while. It, it kind of disarms them, not like literally, but like in a figurative sense. Mm -hmm. They're not aggressive or combative. So this student, we'll say his name is 
um, Roger, let's just say a student's name is Roger. Roger had this fit. Roger was then restrained. And I was one of the people that restrained him. But keep in mind, I had the relationship with mm -hmm. him. When, when time passes, it's like 12 hours, 14 hours later, I came back the next day. Roger's looking at me when I came, when I started my shift. And he's like, Mr. Creekmore, like, how are you going to do me like that? I was like, well, what are you talking about? He's like, how are you going to do me like that? Like, you were one of them that, like, held me down to yeah. drop my butt, man. Like, he didn't say it like that, so you can imagine. Um, yeah. He said it a little bit more colorfully. Yeah, yeah. I just, I had to hold that for a second because I was like, damn, he's he's right. Like, he was like, he didn't say I trusted you, but you could tell what he was conveying was like, dude, I trusted you. Like, mm -hmm. cool. And you, like, kind of turned on me like, who the hell am I supposed to trust now? So I sat with him in that moment. And I just had to admit to him, yo, my bad. Like, I tried to explain it. But in the moment, realizing that even though what I was saying was true, it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter yeah. to Roger. Because all Roger knows is Mr. Creekmore, someone he trusted yeah. and thought was, you know, on his side, like understood him, mm -hmm. laid hands on him, restrained him, and helped him get a PRN in his ass. Sorry. It's no, it's all good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. So, he's like, dude, like what what the hell? So I had to sit there with that for a second and let him know, I'm sorry. Like mm -hmm. my bad. Like when situations happen like that, I walked him through it, explained it to him. He was still upset, but he did say he understood it. And he said, at least you explained it to me not like everyone else did like he said no mm -hmm. one else they just tell us to do it like you get pretty much you you got what you deserved and i wouldn't try to tell him that. i was just trying to explain to him yo this is what happened yeah. and i'm sorry I, but i get what you're saying like i totally get it and i think that goes a long way because as you said as you alluded to in our generation no <laughs> you do as i you do as i say not that as i it. do yeah mm -hmm. i know you just saw me do that but you're not going to do that mm -hmm. you know? The hell i told you to do mm -hmm. and not saying that my parents were like that um not to that extent but mine either but like very yeah. generationally speaking it was yeah. so as much as i want to chat with both of you for so long because it's just so great to catch up yeah yes i do want to know before we hop off what your definition of kindness would be i mean i feel like we've talked about it right all of these themes are in your book all of these themes of kindness and what true kindness is has been like woven throughout this podcast but if you had to come up with a definition what would it be for me i'm just speaking of where i am in life right now i feel like kindness is speaking up for those who who, who doesn't who don't have a voice right now mm. um yeah, speaking in rooms that they may not hear you speaking in and you still choose to speak up um, and advocate for them. Yeah. I feel like it's it's definitely an act. So it's a, it's a verb, like it's something mm -hmm. that you do. And I feel like it is something that is done regardless of, and this is the part that I think sometimes gets missed, regardless of a person's race, religion, political affiliation, um, gender, uh, sexuality, any of those things. Mm -hmm. it, it, it transcends all of that. It's just something that you do to help your fellow human. Mm -hmm. Like it's an act that you do to actually help someone. That's I feel like that's that's more of kindness. Given the compliment, that's cool and all. I know some people say, well, that was that was a kind gesture. But like actually like that was a little bit past that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like that's more like niceness, right? Like yeah, that yeah, difference that's between nice. kindness and niceness. Mm -hmm. um, not to say that those things don't feel good or that they yeah. don't matter yeah. too. Yeah. But I just always think that kindness goes a little bit deeper. So I'm happy you both said that. And Nita, what you said about speaking in rooms where people won't hear it really resonated with me. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just, I'm still sitting with that because that's the piece right like our egos are aside at that moment yeah no one is recognizing what you are doing or yeah. you know it, it just i don't know that's really 
That's something I needed to hear. And I think that's important. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you both so much for all the work you were doing. Please, 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 if you're listening to this, go support, go purchase their book, be a part of Creekmore Conversations. <laughs> <laughs> because they have lots of beautiful ones. Um, and I'm just grateful to be in this space with you both. We're grateful to be in your space. Yes. We love absolutely. the work that you're doing. From, um, day, from day one. From, day one. From the moment we met you. That's yeah. how I feel. Yeah. Friends, see, like this, this is a um, relationship in action, right? 100%. Yes. And yes. they can happen. They can happen in many, many ways. That's right. So yes. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you all so much for listening to this episode of the Kindness Is Podcast. If you love it and it's adding even a little bit of value to your life, we would love, love, love if you could subscribe, rate, and review so we can reach even more people and make this world a little bit more kind.